Welcome to Remove's course in Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is Raw Materials and Basics Ceramic Chemistry. In this particular week, we are going to discuss about ceramic industry. Most of the products of ceramic industries are some kind of clayways or potteries, etc. Right? So, because of that reason, traditional name of ceramic industries is also clay products. Right? Not only clay products, it is also known as uh, uh, silicate industries because most of the clays are having one or other kind of silicates. Right? So, that is variety of products of ceramic industries are essentially silicates only because of that reason the ceramic industry was known as a silicate industries in uh, earlier days traditionally. Okay? However, nowadays so many varieties of uh, products have been developed based on the consumer needs etc. So, because of that one calling ceramic industry silicate industry in today's context is not appropriate because there are some kind of ceramic products which are produced with uh, some basic knowledge or basic information input not only from the knowledge point of view but also from the material point of view some inputs are there from the metallurgical industry as well. So, calling them only silicate industry is not appropriate in the present day context. Okay? Some of the uh, ancient days examples of ceramic industry products are pottery and then burnt clayware etc. But nowadays demand for superior materials have led to broader spectrum of products. Earlier you have only some kind of uh, uh, potteries or uh, clayware only uh, were you know being produced in uh, ceramic industries. But nowadays what happens so many demands have come for different types of uh, products like you know some kind of uh, semiconductor chips also there also it is required to have a, you know uh, specified uh, design and then product requirement which are produced not only from uh, the products uh, not only from the raw materials of the ceramic industry but also from uh, metallurgical industry also. For example, like many people uh, in place of their broken uh, teeth they used to have a silver crowned or gold uh, crown and teeth etc they may be implanted right so they are you know a kind of a cross fertilization of a ceramic industry with metallurgical industry is done similarly for several semiconductor chips also some kind of combination of a ceramic industry knowledge and then metallurgy knowledge is required okay so because of such kind of demand for superior materials or different types of material the spectrum of products of ceramic industries has become very broader uh, these days so, when you have a broader spectrum of uh, products then obviously you need to have a you know uh, much more input to get such kind of products. So, in order to meet such demands modern methods of fabrication inventions have led to cross fertilization of silicate industry with metallurgy and solid state physics. Okay? Modern fabrication methods also aided by coupling with many computer controlled processes and advancing automations because sometimes when you prepare such kind of uh, semiconductor chips etc. and then uh, gold crown teeth etc. you know you need to control the process conditions very uh, specifically of required temperature within plus or minus 5 degree centigrade especially when the operating temperature is very high in the range of 900 or more than 900 or 1000 degree centigrade etc. You know controlling temperature within small range of uh, error of plus or minus 5 percent degree centigrade is uh, very difficult when the range of operating temperature is very high like you know 1000 degree centigrade, 1200 degree centigrade something like that. So, for that it is uh, very essential to have computer controlled processes and then advancing automation technology you know are very much essential for the growth of the industry. Not only from uh, you know basic raw materials of ceramic industry and then uh, with some inputs from the metallurgical industry variety of uh, ceramic products are uh, produced, but also from waste also different types of uh, ceramic products are in general developed. Something like you know some inorganic uh, waste uh, like fly ash from the power plants. You know that may be uh, fly ash usually you know mostly is a uh, waste product it is not being utilized for any other purpose. So, that is being utilized by the ceramic industry to make different types of uh, you know uh, bricks. Similarly, mine tailings etc they are also a kind of wastage project from the prospective of the uh, mine, mine industries. 
right? So those mine tilings also utilized to get or uh, prepare some kind of bricks uh, or ceramic products. Likewise, you know metal slags in metallurgical industries after getting the refined product of required nature, required characteristics, a lot amount of metal slag is produced. There may be important ingredients in those metal slags, but recovering them may not be economically feasible, right? So because of that reason, it is better to utilize them for some other application. So such kind of metal slags are also used for a uh, brick making kind of thing which can be done by ceramic industry principles. So thus as explained, several types of uh, bricks uh, can be made from different types of inorganic waste and then what are the such uh, inorganic waste which can be utilized for making bricks? Fly ash from power plants, foundry sand, mine tilings and then furnace slag and a large variety of other uh, materials as well. Now from the product point of view, if you wish to have a product from a ceramic uh, industry, uh, what kind of characteristics you supposed to expect or you may be expecting in general? So, especially you know uh, from the applications point of view either in plant applications or in uh, household applications or societal applications etc you first see like that material must be mechanically stable that must be uh, chemically stable that must be thermally stable such kind of characteristics you see so those characteristics we are seeing now new products from ceramic industry have been developed as per demand for materials those materials should have following uh, characteristics. Thermally stable, materials you can say thermally stable if they can withstand higher temperatures, higher temperatures of uh, several hundred degrees centigrade or even sometimes more than 1000 degrees centigrade also. Let us say furnaces like yeah, from the chemical industry point of view or application in industry point of view, these furnaces are made up of several types of refractories, right? So we have seen uh, some of the refractories are used for uh, making glass making etc in one of the previous uh, week lectures, right? So now what we have seen, so the operating temperature in uh, those furnaces is very high, order of 1200 to 1400 degrees centigrade something like that, right? So the raw materials are fed into the furnace and then furnace is supplied energy so that to raise the temperature to uh, you know required temperature of uh, 1000, 1200 or 1400 degrees centigrade something like that. So at this temperature definitely there would be reactions amongst the materials that have been fed to the furnace, right? So now the refractories that are uh, being used to make this furnace they should be chemically stable as well as the thermally stable. Thermally they should be stable up to this temperature or even beyond that one. And then what are the products are forming, chemical products are forming, what are the uh, input chemical uh, reactants given to those furnaces at such high temperature. So these uh, refractories should be uh, chemically stable to those chemical nature of the components as well. So that is also required. So this is from the chemical industry point of view, right? If you have a sewage, you know, a sludge, etc., they are uh, allowed to flow through certain kind of uh, enclosed area where you need uh, sewage tiles, etc. So these sludges etc are very acidic actually in general. Though the temperature may not be very high in such conditions but they are very acidic, right? So then you know uh, when the material or sludge passes through such enclosed area which is uh, you know uh, covered with the sewage tiles etc. So then the sewage tiles should be you know chemically stable against those kind of uh, those acidic uh, sludges etc. So chemical stability is also required. So like that if you keep on saying that mechanical uh, stability is also a, a very much essential, right? You know, floor tiles, etc. You in general have, and then you know, uh, sometimes you know what happens at the household uh, purpose or office hold purpose. Also, you may be shifting or moving the furniture from one place to the other place, and then weight of such furnitures may be very high in general, some hundreds of cages or something like that. So, if these uh, tiles, floor tiles, etc., are breaking to such mechanical weight itself so then that is not going to good. So that is the reason you know you need to have a mechanical stability uh, in your product, okay? So the second one is mechanical stability. So that product should resist greater pressure and superior mechanical properties. Then chemically stable, they should protect against corrosive chemicals, right? Sometimes you know your product, your ceramic product should have all these three characteristics as per requirements. Let us say furnaces made up of refractories etc. One good example. 
right. Such kind of examples we have already seen in uh, other uh, classes where you know glass making and then uh, cement industries etc. In those cases we have seen you know so much of you know these materials which, which are used for the ceramic making you know they are also there. So, you expect to have all these thermal stability, mechanical stability and chemical stability in one single applications. In sometimes in for uh, uh, given applications you may look at only one particular important characteristic like you know thermal stability, other applications you primarily concentrate on mechanical stability, other applications you may concentrate on chemical stability. But sometimes you know there may be cases in some applications you may require to have a stability against the thermal applied temperature, mechanical uh, forces and then chemical corrosiveness etc. all of them together. Also possess special electrical characteristics as well. Okay. So, those are the requirement of a ceramic products. You supposed to expect or you are expected to make a ceramic product which is thermally, mechanically and chemically also stable. right? So, now what could be such kind of products in general? right? So, if you see you know uh, range of uh, ceramic industry products is now broader, it is no more uh, very limited in general. So, however, we try to have a classification of uh, different types of uh, ceramic industry products and then see what are they and then we will be discussing about those uh, kind of ceramic industries products only in this and in coming lectures. Following types of essential ceramic products would only be discussed because of uh, time limitations. Okay. White waste is one type, another one is the structural uh, clay products, another one is the refractories fourth one is specialized ceramic products and then finally enamels and then enameled metals. These five types of ceramic products we are going to discuss in detail from their manufacturing applications and then uses etc. point of view we are going to discuss these five types of ceramic products. Now, uh, what are the things that are uh, covered under the white waste or what are the ceramic products that comes under uh, white waste? They are nothing but china ware, earthen ware, pottery, stone ware, vitreous ware, etc. By name, white ware, why the name is given white ware for them? Because mostly their appearance is white in color. There may be some kind of uh, textures and then some designs may also be there of different colors, but primarily these products, you know, they are in white in color. So, that is the reason they are known as white wares. Similarly, second one is the structural clay product. Structural clay products, the name by the structural means the products that are produced by ceramic industry, they are used to make some kind of structures like you know some kind of bricks etc. So, those things comes under structural clay products category that is building brick, face brick, terracotta, sewer pipe, drain tiles etc. Next one is the refractories which include fire bricks, silica brick, chromite brick, magnesite chromite brick, silicon carbide brick, zirconia refractories and then silicate, aluminum silicate, alumina products etc. all comes under the refractories. For the case of specialized ceramic products like gold coated ceramic wafers for semiconductor chips are one of the common application for the specialized ceramic products or it is one of the important product that comes under specialized ceramic products. Similarly, ceramic capped gold dental crowns and then zirconia line steel for corrosion resistant uses etc. all they come under specialized ceramic products. Specialized because they are uh, developed for the specialized applications like you know semiconductor chips or you know gold dental crowns etc. for those purpose special application purpose they develop. So, that is the reason these products are uh, you know called as specialized ceramic products. Likewise, under enamels and then enameled metals applications of enamel to gold, silver and copper etc. used in different types of decorative art etc. those kind of products comes under this category. Now, we discuss about uses and applications and economics of a ceramic industry. In ceramic industry it is very difficult to measure the uh, sales volume of ceramic products because many of these are used as components of other finished materials which are classified under other industries. Let us say furnaces one example. Furnaces or manufacturing or development of furnaces does not come under ceramic industries, but you know whatever the refractories 
are used for making such kind of furnaces, they are produced by the ceramic industry, but you know they are utilized for some other industry that is the reason such kind of many cases are there. You know the products are primarily of ceramic industry, but from the end use wise they are in some other industries or for some other uh, purpose. So, that is the reason getting or measuring the appropriate sales volume of ceramic products is very difficult. Okay? Up to 60 percent of all clay produced, clay not the product, clay produced utilized in the manufacture of heavy clay construction products and then out of this 60 percent of clay that is used for a heavy clay construction products, you know out of which building brick, sewer pipe and then drain tiles account for 38 percent, 19 percent account for uh, Portland cement, lightweight aggregates account for 10 percent, right. And more examples under these cases of products of ceramic industries or you know uh, ingredients of ceramic industries are used in some other industry or like you know they include paper and pulp industry, cement industry, glass industry, you know so many things uh, associated with the ceramic industries, they are also associated with the cement and glass industry and the same you can realize as we progress uh, ahead into the course of uh, ceramic industries. Refractories also use large quantities of clays. Clays are also used as fillers in many products such as paper, rubber, plastics, paints and fertilizers. Some clays are also used in adsorbent applications like silica etc. They are also used as adsorbent and then uh, silica is one of the important component of a ceramic industry. Other applications include drilling mud, floor and wall tiles pelletizing iron ore, pottery, etc. all they may be included in the uses and applications of ceramic industries. Now, we have seen a few basics of uh, ceramic industries and then what are the different types of characteristics that you expect from a given ceramic product and then what are the different types of uh, ceramic products are possible, etc. applications, uses, etc. those things we have seen. Now, we see uh, basic raw materials of the ceramic industry. This particular lecture is targeted primarily on basic raw materials and then basic ceramic chemistry. So, first part of the lecture we are going to start now that is on basic raw material. Why are we discussing so much about the raw materials? Because that we are going to realize in almost all ceramic products clay is one of the important raw material. Then along with that one there are other raw materials like you know uh, sand, feldspar, etc. or this. That is the reason it is very much essential to understand or learn a few basics about such raw materials as well. Okay? Rather simply mentioning these are the raw materials utilized for production of several uh, ceramic products, it is important to understand their basic chemistry as well. So, basic raw materials of ceramic industry, three main raw materials are very common in any of the uh, ceramic product that you take. So, one of them is clay, another one is the feldspar, third one is the sand. Okay? Primary source of uh, feldspar mineral is igneous rocks. Clays are more or less impure hydrated aluminum silicates resulted from withering of such rocks as per the reaction given below. That is, if you take potash feldspar, actually Feldspar, different types of feldspars are there, potash feldspar and then uh, soda feldspar, lime feldspar, etc. That based on the feldspar, you know Al2O3, uh, SiO2 are common and then third one whatever is there based on that one the name is given. Now here K2O is there, so that is the reason this feldspar is having the name of potash feldspar. If it reacts with uh, carbon dioxide and water at high temperatures, then you get a clay mineral, one of the clay mineral is kaolinite which is having the formula Al2O3 to SiO2 to H2O. Right? This is one of the raw material from or uh, one of the clay mineral that is uh, required for almost all ceramic products production. Okay? So, when this reaction takes place along with the potassium carbonate and then silica, you get a clay mineral kaolinite which is very essential for most of the ceramic products manufacturing. So, now what we do? We discuss individually about each of them. Now, we talk about clays. Clays are primarily 
having several types of minerals, they are also known as the clay minerals. These minerals include several types of inorganic oxides, primarily inorganic oxides should be there. Some of them may be important for a given application of ceramic industry, some of them are important for a given application of glass industry, some of them are may be important for the uh, given application of a cement industry like that are there. So, what we have to do? We have to do a kind of a clay upgrading so that to get the required minerals which are essential from the ceramic products making point of view. Okay? So, number of mineral species are available which are known as clay minerals. These mainly contain mixtures of kaolinite which is having formula Al2O3, 2SiO2, 2H2O. Then Montmorillonite which is nothing but MgO, Al2O3, 5SiO2 and H2O or CaO, Al2O3, 5SiO2 and H2O. Right? Then third one is illite which contains variable amounts of K2O, MgO, Al2O3, SiO2, H2O. Now you see, you know all of them are inorganic oxides except this H2O component because H2O is coming because these are hydrated. right? So, you see primarily inorganic oxides only. So, clay is primarily consisting of inorganic oxides. So, out of which this kaolinite is uh, used uh, to larger extent to produce different types of uh, inorganic, uh, different types of uh, ceramic products. From ceramic industry viewpoint, clays are plastic and moldable you know they should be moldable actually the, this clays etc feldspar etc and then uh, sand etc you take together and then you heat it to the higher temperature so certain reactions taking place right so those things we are going to see anyway so when such reactions takes place you get a you know a liquefied sample which should be in a moldable conditions right so that you know you can make a required product shape and then you know design etc so clays uh, should be plastic and they should be moldable when sufficiently high temperature is supplied to those clays. Then only it is a uh, good one for production of a certain kind of ceramic products. Okay? So, these clays should be finely pulverized and then wet, they should be wettable right? because without uh, if they are not wettable it is going to be very difficult to make a product of required shape. right? And then when they dry they should be rigid. And then when you fire them at high temperature or calcine them at high temperature like 1200-1400 degrees centigrade, they should be vitreous. Okay? So, from the ceramic industry viewpoint, clay should be plastic and moldable when sufficiently finely pulverized and wet, rigid when dry and vitreous when fired at a suitably high temperature. Most importantly, manufacturing process depend upon these properties of clays. So, all these properties uh, we are going to discuss uh, from the product point of view. So, now what are these clay minerals in general include? They include varying amounts of feldspar, quartz and then other impurities such as iron oxides. Okay? So, obviously when you have impurities, you know they should be removed. They may not be impurities for other industry like metallurgical industry or something like that. But they are impurities as far as you know we are concerned about the ceramic industries. So, now from the ceramic industries point of view such impurities should be removed. Other kind of impurities may include like mica etc. They should be removed. In almost all clays used in ceramics, the most important basic clay mineral is kaolinite. This is very much essential. Okay? However, very high plasticity is desired bentonite clays based on Montmorillonite are used to some extent. What do you mean by actually high plasticity and then high workability or moldability? When you apply high temperature to the raw materials mixture, they become liquid kind of products and then they should have proper flowability etc. So, then we can say that the material is having you know workable kind of conditions. Okay? Physical conditions of clay greatly influence the property of uh, plasticity or workability definitely. And then the influence varies among different types of clays, one clays to other clays, the whatever the influence of this clays is there, so that is going to be changing. Purpose of clays is for particular properties and are frequently blended 
to give most favorable results. Different clays are used actually, though we are uh, calling like kaolinite is uh, one of the mostly used clay in ceramic industry, but other types of uh, clays are also there, right? So, they, they are also used. You know, each one is having certain kind of, uh, you know, applications, certain kind of characteristics, but it has been found that when you mix them frequently, you know, blend them, so then you get most favorable results from the product point of view. So, as we have already uh, seen, the clays that are uh, we are having, you know, it is having impurities, impurities like sand, mica, iron oxide, etc. So, they have to be removed. Removal of uh, uh, these impurities from the clay is known as clay beneficiation. We are not calling clay purification because clay is not one single component that we are purifying, it is a combination of different components, right? So, but however, from this mixture of different components, we are removing some of the impurities. They are impurities from the ceramic industry point of view only, right? Otherwise, those impurities after removal, they can also be used in some other applications. Let us say iron oxide, if you are producing in a good quantity, so you can use it in metallurgical industry. Let us say mica impurity, you are separating in a, a large quantity, so that should be sent to the mica plant for a proper uh, utilization point of view. They are impurities from the ceramic industry point of view only. Clays differ very much in their physical properties and impurities present in clays. Thus, often it is necessary to do upgrading of clays, upgrading in the sense removing unnecessary or undesired components from the clays, okay? So, this upgrading is done by beneficiation process which is primarily, you know, uh, includes uh, unit operations only, unit operations. Whenever we have beneficiations, etc., you can clearly understand that, uh, you know, there is a froth flotation is possible, there is a uh, size separation is possible, you know, thickening is possible. So, all of these things are unit operations only. So, what you understand, you know, not only this clay beneficiation, upcoming sections of production of different types of clay products, you see primarily, you know, unit operations are only involved, okay? Primarily sand and mica are removed from clay by their beneficiation, China clay beneficiation flowchart we are going to discuss in the next slide anyway. Here one can see that almost all steps involved in the China clay beneficiation are unit operations only. There are no chemical reactions. There are only physical changes are there, okay? Physical changes, size separation is one thing that you can definitely uh, expect in separations of or, you know, beneficiations of ore, etc. And that is done by the screening or selective settling for the size separation and then filtration would be there to filter out the unnecessary things, okay? Then after filtration, you definitely need to dry the material before processing to the next level, okay? And there may be other kind of uh, unit operations like, you know, thickener, etc., hydrostatic separators or uh, magnetic separators, etc., those things may also be possible. So, we have listed only a few. In this process, colloidal properties are controlled by appropriate additives such as sodium silicate and alum. You need to have a uh, flocculating agents, etc., you need to have a defloculating agents, etc., in the process. So, so they are required to maintain the colloidal properties, okay? So, those things we are going to see. However, chemical purification is also used for high purity materials such as like you need to produce a pure alumina or pure titania, then you can go for a chemical purification, okay? But majorly, most of the clay products, you know, you do not need to go for a chemical purification of uh, clays. You can go for a uh, clay beneficiation which is uh, done by several physical uh, steps or unit operation steps. Now, here we see the flow chart for the China clay beneficiation, right? Here what we have? We have a pebble mill, right? To this one we are feeding crude kaolin from the crude kaolin storage through a vibrating feeder. Why vibrating feeder? Because these may be having of different sizes, right? And then may not uh, able to pass easily uh, through the columns or, you know, pipes, etc. So, then a vibrator 
is provided to the fader so that you know vibration will enhance the movement of this uh, particulate matter. Usually particulate matter does not flow down easily even if it is uh, by the gravity or by pressure or whatever. So, you know storage and transport of solids is a very difficult task. So, for that reason you know vibrating feeders are often used to transport the solid materials. So, this crude kaolin is fed to the pebble mill through a vibrating feeder. To this one you are also giving defloculating agents because this crude kaolin storage whatever uh, uh, is there from that the material that you take that may be wet or a uh, bit damp. If it is wet or damp so it may not flow through easily so for that reason also you need to have a vibrating feeder. If it is wet or damp then what happens? You know uh, when the material is taken to the pebble mill where required size reduction is taking place. That will also not be efficient if the material is wet because if it is wet you know they may form lumps kind of thing. So, when it is forming lumps so rather size reduction taking place breaking of lumps will only be taking place or most of the energy utilized for the size reduction would be utilized for the lumps breaking which is not at all required. So, for that reason there are some defloculating agents are you know provided. So, these defloculating agents along with the water are provided here. Okay. So, this uh, pebble mill is nothing but a cylindrical container which will be rotating and then rotational speed should be such a way that uh, it should not be more than the critical speed. Critical speed is the one you know at which the centrifugal forces are balanced by the gravity force. So, your rotational speed has to be less than the speed at which centrifugal force is balanced by the gravity force acting on the material that has been fed to this uh, rotating drum. Right? This pebble mill is nothing but rotating drum way you can visualize as a rotating drum. To this drum you have taken pebble, if it is a ball mill you will be taking a balls, steel balls or you know wooden balls etc. If it is a uh, rod mill so then you may be having metallic rods or wooden rods etc may be there as a kind of uh, you know grinding medium. Now here it is a pebble mill so then pebbles of different sizes of different nature would be taken into the material as a, a grinding medium. To this one when the material whatever the kaolin is there that comes in right. So, and then when it rotates movement the rotation takes place the material whichever was there at the bottom that will be gradually moves up and then moment it reaches the top location the material will fall down. Now, the material is the combination of the feed material plus these pebbles. So, when they fall down so a kind of impaction takes place and then some grinding takes place and then material size reduction takes place. Right? So, size reduced material will then be uh, passed through different uh, steps of uh, unit operations like a classification, hydro separation and then concentration tables and magnetic separators etc. as per the requirement. Right? So, the magnetic separators are usually to catch the materials which are having magnetic properties. Right? When this uh, size reduced material comes and interact with this uh, magnetic separators, in the materials if any uh, material which is having magnetic properties they will be captured here and then remaining material will be sent forward. Right? So, here you know mesh sizes or different mesh sizes are there as per the requirement you know this size operation is taken place. If you require 60 mesh size so accordingly the process would be taken place. If you need 200 mesh size materials then accordingly the steps would be uh, considered. What do you mean by mesh size? I already explained let us say within a sieve if you have a sieve like this. So, within this uh, uh, screen or mesh you take a uh, one linear inch, one linear inch uh, distance and then within that linear inch distance let us say this is one linear inch distance. Within this one if you have only four openings 1, 2, 3, 4. So, then this is called 4 mesh. So, what you see if the mesh number is smaller the opening would be bigger. Let us say if you have a, a same 1 linear inch distance here from the screen you have taken. Let us say if you have 60 openings here like this then this mesh is known as 60 mesh and then obviously the openings would be smaller than the 4 mesh. So, 200 mesh even smaller would be there like you know a few micron size opening would be there. 
okay. So that is what the mesh anyway. So now after passing these materials whatever the material that is coming over from the 60 mesh that is taken to a flotation cell to which reagents or uh, flotation or froth forming uh, reagents are uh, supplied and then mechanical agitation is also uh, done so that you know froth formation takes place and bubbles forms, bubbles forms and the froth of bubbles uh, you know raise to the top of the uh, flotation cell, right. So when they raise here, so whatever the material having the lower density that material will be stick to these bubbles and then they will be floating. So in this case mica is the one which is having lower density, so that will be attached to the bubbles and then they will be floating on the top, so then they will be separated out and taken to the mica drying plant, okay. Whereas the material which is passed through 200 mesh which is primarily having the desired uh, clay minerals, you know they will be taken to a thickener here. Here in the thickener are nothing but you know settling, you know settling by the gravity. So if it is uh, settling by the gravity, so then gravity thickener, if it is settling by the centrifugal force then it is known as the centrifugal thickener, okay. So here the wastage material will be floating from the top that is taken and then from the bottom which is the important clay mineral that will be followed through different sections of uh, pressure filter and then dryer etc. to get the final clay mineral which has been purified, beneficiated using physical process, physical changes. There are no chemical reactions at all in this process, okay. That is about the uh, clay beneficiation. Now we go to the second raw material that is feldspar. Three common types of feldspar used in ceramic industry to some extent, they are nothing but potash, soda and then lime based feldspar. So potash based is nothing but K2O, Al2O3 because of K2O presence it is known as a potash feldspar whereas the soda is having Na2O that is the reason it is called as soda feldspar and then the next one is having CaO that is the reason it is known as lime based feldspar, okay. It is primarily good as fluxing constituent in the ceramic formulas. What do you mean by fluxing? It you know they reduce, these components reduce the temperature of reaction or vitrification temperature. You need to do some kind of vitrification. Now most of the ceramic products if you see a kind of glassy shining kind of appearance you have that is because of the vitrification, right. So that the vitrification is usually uh, can be done at high temperatures for most of the ceramic products. But if you have a, a good fluxing constituents the temperature would be reduced, right. That is the reason these components, there are some of these components are known as the fluxing constituents in uh, ceramic product formulas, okay. It may present in the clay as mined or may be added as needed. Third important uh, raw material is sand or flint. For light colored products sand with a low iron content should be used. Now we see formulas and properties of basic raw materials for ceramic industry. So from the clay minerals we take kaolinite, from the feldspar we take uh, potash feldspar and then sand is the other one we are taking. Formula, plasticity, fusibility, melting point and shrinkage and burning are discussed here, right. So, Kaolinite formula we already know that Al2O3, 2SiO2, 2H2O, it is plastic in nature. So it is a good one because most of the ceramic materials or you know raw materials of the ceramic uh, industry they should be plastic. And then fusibility they are of a refractory nature because they are not fusible even at a temperature of 1400 degrees centigrade. Why they are not fusible uh, even at this temperature because their melting point is 1785 degrees centigrade, right. But the problem is that on burning they undergo much shrinkage. From the thermal stability point of view if you think that you know uh, melting point is very high uh, and then it is infusible even at 1400 degrees centigrade, if you think that you take most of the raw material as kaolinate, let us say 80 percent you take kaolinate and remaining 20 percent uh, feldspar or sand if you take you know you may not uh, get a final product. You may have a thermally stable product but you may not have a proper product because on heating you know kaolinate undergoes a much shrinkage which is not good, okay. So feldspar, 
formula is K2O, Al2O3, 6 SiO2, it is a non-plastic but it is easily fusible. Why it is easily fusible? Because its melting point is 1150 degrees centigrade only, right? So, but it fuses does not mean that it is not good. If when it fuses, what it does? It acts as a binder. It acts as a binder and then keep the components tied together themselves, right? So, it is not the fusibility uh, that you have to see, but also other parameters also you have to see. And then on heating, it fuses rather shrinking. Okay. Third one is the sand which is uh, SiO2, it is a non-plastic and it is a refractory because its melting temperature is uh, 1710 degrees centigrade and because of that one it is infusible even at 1400 degrees centigrade. But good thing is that it does not go any kind of shrinkage on burning. So now you see one of the material is very much shrinkage, another one is the no shrinkage and a third one is the undergoes uh, fusing on burning. So important raw materials, three important materials are having three important characteristics. So proper combination of these materials one has to take as per the requirement of the product and then make a required uh, ceramic product. So because of their uh, distinctive characteristics, all of them are very much essential from the ceramic products viewpoint. So that is what we have seen about raw materials, primarily three important raw materials, clays, feldspar and then sand. So we have discussed uh, in detail about them and then we compared properties as well, right? What does it mean by? Does it mean that ceramic industry is having only these uh, three raw materials? No, there are n number of other raw materials are also there. They are also having certain kind of you know characteristics requirements as well. So those things we are going to discuss now. In addition to three main raw materials, a wide variety of other minerals, salts, oxides are also used as fluxing agents and special refractory ingredients. Fluxing agents, the purpose, they reduce the reaction temperature or vitrification temperature. That is the reason you need to have such fluxing agents. And then special refractory ingredients are required because these are infusible even at high temperatures of 1400-1500 degrees centigrade. Okay. They also provide some kind of vitrification to the product. Some fluxing agents that lower vitrification temperature or reaction temperature are provided here. Likewise, some common special refractory ingredients are provided here. Many other raw materials are also used in various combinations as well. And then at least 450 have been classified as a kind of important raw material from different applications point of view. 450 out of which 3 are very much essential, clay, feldspar and then sand or flint. So that is about the raw materials and then their characteristics, importance, etc. from the ceramic industry point of view. Now we are going to see second important topic of the today's lecture that is basic ceramic chemistry. Chemical conversions and basic ceramic chemistry. Ceramic products are prepared by combining different amounts of raw materials this, that we have discussed, shaping and heating to firing temperatures. Required temperatures may range, may range from several hundred degrees centigrade to several thousand degrees centigrade as well as per the requirement. Let us say if you wanted to have a over glazed product, then required temperature may be as low as 700 degrees centigrade only. But if you wanted to have many vitrified products as like uh, glass products or you know vitrified ceramic products, etc., so then temperature would be as high as 2000 degrees centigrade. Okay? Firing at such range of temperatures leads to various reactions which are chemical basis for chemical conversions, right? A few important reactions include dehydration or chemical water smoking at 150 to 650 degree centigrade. Then calcination, for example, calcination of uh, calcium carbonate at 600 to 900 degree centigrade. And then oxidation of ferrous iron and organic matter at 350 to 900 degree centigrade. And then silicate formation beyond 900 degree centigrade. Now you see these are the generalized uh, reaction nature. Not only these reaction, there may be another number of reactions may also be possible. But Categorically, if you wanted to present, these are the four important reactions that are possible in basic ceramic uh, industry when the ceramic product is produced. Now, 
they are not like that individually step by step they take place. Like so you can see here let us say at 600 degrees centigrade dehydration may also take place, calcination may also take place and even oxidation of ferrous iron materials may also take place. Right? So, at a given temperature more than one of these steps may possible, but however at uh, temperature more than 900 degrees centigrade only silicate formation takes place, silicate formation taking place that means product formation is taking place. Right? And then what you uh, realize here these reactions whatever the dehydration, calcination and oxidation uh, reactions are there, simple reactions, not much uh, chemistry to understand. But whatever this silicate formation taking place beyond 900 degrees centigrade, they are very complex, very complex reactions are there, very difficult to realize them. Okay? So, calcination of calcium carbonate and dehydration and decomposition of kaolinite are very simple reactions, but silicate formations are quite complex reactions. These complex reactions obviously change with the applied temperature and constituents of the raw materials that has been taken to prepare or to make a given ceramic product. So, obviously phase diagram or phase rule in ceramic industries are very important for uh, interpreting empirical observations in ceramic industries and in making predictions for improvements. We are going to see a uh, phase diagram of SiO2 Al2O3. Then you can realize how much important if you have the information of phase diagram for a given combination of material from the product point of view okay? that we are going to see in the next slide. For example, phase diagram of Al2O3 SiO2 display above conclusion on silicate formation that silicate formation is very complicated reaction. This phase diagram has led to important development of mullite refractories right? or the many of the refractories are mullite type refractories which are having 3 Al2O3 2 SiO2 chemical formula. Okay? According to this phase diagram, any percentage of liquefaction can be obtained. If you have pure SiO2 and then Al2O3, then it is a different thing. But if you have a combination of these two, any percentage, 10 percent to 90 percent, so then you know you can obtain the liquefaction at lower temperature itself. Right? If progressive melting is kept from going too far by controlling rise in temperature, sufficient solid skeletal material will remain to hold hot mass together and it shows that molite is only stable compound of alumina and silica at high temperatures that you see here in this slide. Okay? So now here what we have a, we have a pure silica and then we have a pure alpha alumina. Now if you have a pure silica less than uh, 10 percent alumina mixed with the silica, then you know what happens? Liquid and then cristobalite. Cristobalite is nothing but the crystalline silica. It is nothing but crystalline form of the silica is known as the cristobalite that you can get you know if you operate at the temperature more than 1595 degrees centigrade. Right? And then if you have almost like pure alumina that is you know only uh, less than 20 percent, 20, 25 percent of silica only present, then you can have a liquid sample plus corundrum which is nothing but crystalline alumina. This corundrum is nothing but the crystalline alumina at temperatures more than 1840 degrees centigrade. Right? But if you have any percentage of these two from you know let us say 10 to 75 percent, if you take 10 to 75 percent of alumina in silica and then apply the temperature, higher temperatures, what you can see? Irrespective of the composition, irrespective of the composition in this range, you get mullite. Along with that one, there would also be some cristobalite, which is nothing but crystalline silica. It is possible up to 1595 degrees centigrade. But however, if you do not want any crystalline silica, you need a liquid sample and then what you do? You further increase the temperature. So, within the same composition range you can get still molite you get and then liquids you get within this envelope. You can where the composition variations are there between 10 to 75 percent of alumina and silica. Right? But now here you can see uh, if you have almost like pure alumina, so then corundrum and then 
moonlight. Here also you get moonlight up to the temperature of 1840 degree centigrade. But if you go beyond this temperature, you do not get moonlight here. Right? Here also for the uh, silica which is almost pure silica with little alumina, then if you go beyond this temperature of uh, 1595 degree centigrade, you get uh, liquid as well as the crystallite uh, silica, right? but you do not get any moonlight. Moonlight has been found to be very good refractory. So, if you are targeting that one, so and then what is your uh, source of SiO2 and then Al2O3? Accordingly, you take a composition and then you make a mixture. So, then definitely you are going to get a moonlight as long as the variation of the composition is between 10 to 75 percent and then temperature it is even at 1400 degree centigrade also these formation are taking place. So, now availability of uh, these two components and then requirement of the products. What, what do you want to have in the products? You want to have more corundrum in uh, uh, along with the moonlight or you want to have uh, more crystallite along with the moonlight in your uh, final product at higher temperature. So, accordingly you can design the composition, accordingly you can design the temperatures, application temperature. Okay? So, now you can see how much essential to understand phase diagram. If you have a phase diagram, so you can get so much information from, uh, from the product point of view. Let us say moonlight is one of the example here. Almost all ceramic products are refractory that is resistant to heat. Degree of refractoriness of a given product is determined by the relative quantities of refractory oxides and fluxing oxide. Fluxing oxide we have seen, so fluxing oxide they reduce the reaction temperature or vitrification temperature, whereas the refractory oxides they provide uh, required uh, thermal resistance or thermal stability. Important refractory fluxes are uh, given here, but there are some less commonly used to fluxes, uh, refractory fluxes are also there, they are here, given here. Main important fluxing oxides are uh, these things with fluorides in certain compositions are also possible. So, now what we understand until now in ceramic products clay such as kaolinite mostly not the only one is a very common ingredient and then thus its reaction with applied high temperature are essential to understand. Right? So, at 600 to 650 degree centigrade the applied energy drives off the water of hydration that is you know dehydration reaction etc. takes place. Further, at this temperature what happens? Much of the heat is also absorbed by the constituents and leaving an amorphous mixture of alumina and silica as per the reaction. Let us say you have a kaolinite and then supply the temperature of uh, 600 to 650 degrees centigrade, then you can get amorphous alumina, amorphous silica along with the water vapor. So, not only the dehydration taking place, but also getting the amorphous constituents of the mixture, individual components of the mixture you get in the amorphous form that is alumina and silica you are getting in amorphous form that is possible reaction. These observation at this range of temperature are confined by the X-ray studies. Actually these are taking place in high temperature furnaces etc. all those uh, you know refractories etc. Then how to realize what is happening, what components are forming, etc. So, for those kind of solid state uh, physics point of view, X-ray diffraction is one of the easily available tool to confirm the uh, product formation, what are the products are being formed. Okay? A large portion of alumina can also be extracted with hydrochloric acid at this stage of applied temperature range as well. Now, what happens if you keep on increasing the temperature? Right. By continuing the heating, amorphous alumina changes quite sharply to crystalline form at 940 degree centigrade by forming corundrum. Corundrum is nothing but crystalline alumina. Formation to crystalline forms of alumina or gamma alumina evolve considerable heat as well. So, at starting range of uh, 1000 degree centigrade you are gradually increasing temperature. So, 600 to 650 degree centigrade what happens? Mostly dehydration takes place plus formation of the amorphous uh, alumina and silica formation may also take place as per the phase diagram those things we have seen. But if you further increase the temperature to 
940 degrees centigrade etc. What you are getting? You are getting in a crystalline form of a alumina. If you further increase the temperature to 1000 degrees centigrade, what happened? Alumina and silica combine to form moonlight. Okay? So, this is very essential. This is the one of the best refractory that is available. At further higher temperature, remaining silica is converted into crystalline crystabolite. Crystabolite is nothing but crystalline silica. So, thus overall fundamental reaction in heating of clay is this one like kaolinite, 3 moles of kaolinite if you react you get 3 moles of moonlight and then 4 moles of uh, silica and 6 moles of water vapor. Okay? Equilibrium state of alumina and silica mixtures as function of temperature is discussed in phase diagram anyway. Presence of fluxes tends to lower the temperature of formation of uh, moonlight and speeds of the approach to equilibrium. So, that is the importance of this fluxing agents. Okay. Now, we have seen that uh, three are main important uh, raw materials, clay, feldspar and sand or uh, flint etc. Right? So, but we also realize there are many other raw materials are also there, they may be in minor quantities. So, obviously, not only the reaction that we have discussed in the previous slide, many other reactions may also possible. Okay? Not only clay, but also most ceramic product contains many other ingredients as well. So, thus there will be many other reactions involved in the process and then accordingly in the final product not only moonlight, crystabolite, but also many other chemical components may also be present obviously. For example, various silicates and aluminates of calcium, magnesium and possibly alkali metals may also be present in the final product. Okay? But alkali portion of feldspar and most of the fluxing agents become part of glassy or vitreous phase of the ceramic product. Okay? In other words, during heating all ceramic products undergo a certain amount of vitrification or glass formation. So, what do you understand? Ceramic products you can see now as a kind of some kind of uh, crystalline material plus some kind of uh, vitreous nature. Okay? So, thus degree of vitrification depends upon the relative amounts of refractory and then fluxing oxides in the composition and then temperature and time of heating. Thus any ceramic product may be said to consist of a vitreous matrix plus crystals of which moonlight and crystabolite are most important components. Okay? Now, we have already realized that any ceramic product may be said as a kind of vitreous matrix with crystals. So, now based on the degree of vitrification we try to do a classification. Right? Then what we have? Whitewares, high clay products, refractories, enamels, glass we are taking under the types of uh, ceramics. Then what are the corresponding fluxing agents, heating range and degree of vitrification we have here. If you have whitewares, so then fluxing agents range varying amounts have and then heating range may be moderately high temperature. So, varying degree of vitrification is possible because varying amounts of fluxing agents you are taking and then also the applied temperature is moderately high temperature. Whereas, in heavy clay products fluxing agents are present in abundant, but despite of that one vitrification is not high, it is only little that is because the applied temperature is low vitrification takes place better at high temperatures. Okay? So, though here fluxing agents you are having abundant, but the applied temperature is low, so that is the reason you are getting little vitrification. Then refractories, few fluxes are there and then high temperatures are the range of uh, heating. So, since the fluxes are few, you have the little vitrification here as well. Enamels, very abundant flux and then moderately high temperatures are there, so then obviously complete vitrification is possible. Glasses, moderate flux, but the temperatures are very high. If you have high temperature or high heating range with whatever the moderate fluxing agents, you can get complete vitrification. So, that we have already seen in the glass industry anyway. So, this is all about uh, basic raw materials and then basic ceramic chemistry. Right? References for this particular lecture are provided here, but however, the entire lecture is prepared from this reference book.
थैंक यू